Good morning. Today I would like to deliver a lecture on the Jacobian drama. This will be of an introductory nature. I shall be covering Webster's The White Devil in the next lecture. And for building up the background story to that area, I would be delivering a lecture on the Jacobian drama. In this discussion, I will discuss on the areas as follows. I will be discussing on the objectives, give a short introduction to the Jacobian period, conventions and innovations, the Jacobian stage and theatre. I will be talking about Jacobian tragedy, Jacobian tragic comedy, Jacobian comedy, mass, and at the end there will be some questions for you. The following unit aims to provide students a comprehensive idea of Jacobian drama and through this lecture an in-depth understanding of the period conventions and innovations in dramatic form and staging through an introduction to the historical political and literary background of the jacobian period the growth and development of drama shall be traced different forms of drama that were prevalent during the period and the style the language and the contribution of different playwrights shall be described at the end of the lecture some questions for your Preparation for the end semester examination will be given. The Jacobian period in the history of England and Scotland extends from the accession of James I in 1603 to the end of his reign in 1625. These 22 years of the reign of James produced the finest works in the annals of English literature. The period marks a continuation of the spirit of the Elizabethan age that was called a nest of sweet singing birds or even bards as well as an age of drama. The period was influenced by the Renaissance which renewed interest in the Italian forms of performances, plays of Plotters and Terence and Seneca and closet plays adapted for public performance became popular during this period. The period also marks innovations in genric conventions and mixed theatricality. The Jacobian stage utilized the full effect of the revival of learning both for the private court performances as well as for the public theatres. The Jacobian plays combined the intellectual and aesthetic faculties of the Renaissance. The Reformation awakened interest in moral, ethical and spiritual issues. The popularity of the public theatres, the circulation of the English Bible among the English people, the geographical explorations and the discovery of new worlds beyond the seas and the expansion of trade and commerce all these influenced and further enlarged the imagination of creative thinkers of the age. Since the days of Henry VIII, England has evolved as an independent nation, throwing off the yoke of foreign powers and disassociating itself from the Roman Catholicism. The fierce voids of Catholic and Protestant by this time had ended and all the discordant elements had bonded in harmonious coexistence under James I irrespective of the gunpowder plot and the underground activities of the dissenters, especially the Catholics. The extravagant loyalty to James or to Queen Elizabeth I was, however, missing during this rule of James I, who was brought from Scotland, as you know, where he ruled as James VI. William Shakespeare and Ben Jonson carried the spirit of the Elizabethan age into the theatrical culture of the Jacobian age and instead of shaping the theatre, attuned their own dramaturgy to the changing ethos of the age. The classical dramaturgy of the university wits was then replaced by innovations in both form and content, while Shakespeare stepped into the new world order that was ripe unto rottenness with his Hamlet. Ben Jonson's, with a Roman satirical temperament, brought cynicism to the stage with his Walpole. John Webster introduced a maddening world of chaos and decadence with a grotesque macabre of death and his contemporaries like Chapman, Beaumont, Fletcher, Marston, Ford and many others brought to the Jacobian stage a great range of variety. While the world of Jacobian tragedy is a dark and sinister, a world of chaos, corruption, perversion, blood and lust, the world of comedy is city oriented with characters obsessed with money and of course sex. The distinction between tragedy and comedy gradually blurred in Jacobian tragic comedies 
and the new theatrical experience brought the audience closer to the contemporary crisis in morality, politics, society, and economic structures. Another form of performance called Marx became popular during this period in the court of James I and the nobility. The conventions and innovations of this period. During the Jacobian period, performance in the public theater was very popular. The Elizabethan groundlings became more robust during the Jacobian period, and much of the theater arena was occupied by beggars, loafers, petty criminals, pickpockets, drunkards, orange sellers, theater lovers, atheists, and conspirators. Theater became hotspots of sin and crime. During the Elizabethan and Jacobian period, several theater groups were formed. Several public theaters sprang up, writers and players honed their skills, and the managers put the plays on different types of performance space the public, the street, in yards, church, court, even open ground. The competition was most unhealthy, often crime or even ghost infested, but nevertheless most productive. Even every competitor trying to outsmart the other and gain access to the best performance space and audience and make their act commercially successful. If the piece became popular, rival managers often stored it by sending to the performance a clerk who took down the lines in shorthand. Neither authors nor managers had any protection from private and pirate publishers who frequently issued copies of successful plays without the consent of either. After the play had had a London success, it was cut down both in length and in number of parts for the use by the strolling players who strolled all around England to perform the plays. Jacobian theatre offered some more scope for a more flexible use of improvisational transformational acting over spectacle and inset plays, blending of different forms of performance that the playwrights drew from the streets of London and medieval performances. The theatre became equally infested with ghosts, black magic, exorcism, murder, violence and cruelty. Edward Graw Gordon Craig in his article Shakespeare's Collaborator suggests that, I quote, that the dramas were created by Shakespeare in close collaboration with the manager of the theatre and with the actors, in fact, with practically the whole of the company who invented, produced and acted them. The production process involved the knowledge and experience and exposure to different performative arts of the improvisators involved in the making of the play. The reason behind the commercial success of most of the Jacobian plays may be attributed to the producers and actors who kept improving on their production techniques by adding new props, visual and oral effects, and acting techniques. The acting or performance style was heavily indebted to the popular Italian form of comedies, the Commedia dell'Arta, and stories were mostly drawn from Italy and Greece. Shakespeare's use of Plutarch's history of the Greeks and Romans went alongside Hollinshed's chronicles, while Johnson and Webster were fonder of Italian stories for the stage. The Jacobian stage and theatre developed during this period. With the coronation of King James in 1603, the court became the centre of theatrical activities. The plays were commissioned for court performance almost on a regular basis. For example, this court calendar of court performance of Shakespeare's plays in last two months of 1604, listed by E.K. Chambers in Volume 4 of the Elizabethan State, would show the demand of the plays during that period. More than five plays were performed, just written by Shakespeare, within these two months of November and December of 1604 in the court of James I. Few academic plays, mostly in Latin, were performed in the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, Travelling players carried truncated plays to provincial England and the church retained the medieval tradition of religious drama. The plays that succeeded on the public stage were usually invited for court performance along with customized plays or masks suited for court performances. The public theatre was meant for the masses and made theatre an integral part of popular culture and mass culture of that period. In 1587, Philip Henslow built the Rose Theatre and when he joined Admiral's Men, he shifted the performance of the group to the Rose Theatre. 
and under his financial management, several theater companies acted there from 1592 to 1603. Most of the playwrights of the Jacobian age wrote their plays, keeping in mind the apron or the third stage of the Rose or the Globe theaters. The globe was erected with the timber smuggled from the site of the theater that was built way back in 1570 and the timber was smuggled and a new theater was built on the other bank of the Thames in 1599. An identical stage like the other public theaters on the south bank of River Thames came up, such as Swan, Fortune, etc. The stage of the Rose Theater had a diameter of about 70 feet, 21 meter, and the theater had a capacity of about 2,200. Our knowledge about the architecture of the stage is mainly based on the drawing of the Swan Theater by Johannes de Wett. The raised wooden platform of about four to five feet had three performance spaces, the apron just jutting across the ground, visible to the spectators, spectators from the three sides, the middle stage with two pillars and a roof, and the inner stage chamber. The elevation of about 25 feet of the stage had three levels of performance, the lower representing the hell four to five feet below the raised platform, the wooden platform with trap doors represented the earth, the upper balcony five to six feet above the platform that represented an upper level, the heaven, and of course there was the use of the Dux machina. The staging of the act of devilry in the Jacobian stage required the use of this stage with a trap in the middle to allow the supernatural characters to appear, oblique vanish through the trap, in 1598, inventories of the Rose Theater recorded by Henslow reveals a good deal of investment made to buy properties for staging, for example, of Dr. Foster's, such as Dragon in Foster's, the, the suit of Rome, the jerkin that Foster's used as his clock, the invisible clock, interesting, the invisible clock. These are all found in the Henslow papers. More such stage props were added during the Jacobian period, especially for the plays of Shakespeare and Webster. Apart from this stage architecture, large halls were modified for theatrical performance, such as the Black Friars. The staging of masks in the Jacobian courts shifted from open theatricality towards proscenium theater. There was an astonishing diversity of experiment in Jacobian drama that was gradually liberating itself from Renaissance conventions Different types of plays were performed during the Jacobian period, ranging from histories to tragedies, comedies, tragic comedies, farces, melodramas, masks, among others. Now I will be discussing on the Jacobian tragedy. The greatest among the Jacobian playwrights writing successfully the tear-jerking tragedies was, of course, William Shakespeare. The Jacobian period was remarkable for Shakespeare's plays, dealing with the darker side of human experience. Between 1601 and 1607, Shakespeare composed his great tragedies that were produced during the Jacobian period, Hamlet, Othello, King Lear, and Macbeth. During the same period, he wrote tragic plays based on the Grecian and Roman history, plays like Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra, and Timon of Athens. These seven plays exemplify the highest achievement of Renaissance tragedy. The reshaping of the historical materials in the form of tragedy was a popular method to disguise contemporary issues under the garb of history. If Hamlet prepares the audience for the new type of tragic experience on the Jacobian stage while epitomizing the values of Renaissance humanism, Shakespeare's tragic universe gradually became more and more dark and sinister, manifesting the metaphysic of evil as pointed out by G. Wilson Knight. The pricks of conscience that keeps Hamlet procrastinating the final act of revenge go missing in Macbeth, who is hell-bent to write his own destiny without any moral scruples. Othello's suspicious nature, sexual jealousy, and a sense of deprivation lead him to commit rash acts of violent euxoxicide and suicide. King Lear's irascible nature, possessive instinct, power-mongering, senile dementia, culminating in a tragic loss of Cordelia, ending with his own death, stretched pain beyond human endurance. Macbeth is drenched in blood, committed to his obsessive pursuit of 
power through violent acts of sin and displays no marks of repentance even at the moment of his own death. If Shakespeare provided a solid foundation to the development of Jacobian drama, it was of course John Webster, born in 1580 and died in 1625, who gave a distinctive identity to the Jacobian drama. The first notice of John Webster as a playwright was marked as a collaborator paid for his contribution for writing few lines in a play. His career as a dramatist can be traced in the closing years of the reign of Queen Elizabeth and seems to have lasted through the reign of James I. He belonged to a group of writers who often collaborated to write plays. This group, of course, included Monday, Drayton, Middleton, Decker, then Haywood, Wentworth Smith, among others. The following are the tragic plays written wholly or partly by Webster, of which Trace has come down to us, according to C. Wagon. The Guys, 1601, Caesar's Fall, 1602, The White Devil or Vittoria Corombuna in 1612, The Duchess of Malfi, that was produced uh, around 1612, printed in 1623, and Devil's Law Case in 1623. During the Jacobian period, Senecan revenge tragedy became more popular, and especially after the success of Shakespeare's Hamlet. In such tragedies, the revenge plot revolves around a uh, crime, usually usurpation of murder, the pursuit of the detective avenger, the identification of the criminal, and finally the execution of revenge. In Webster's The Duchess of Malfi, the man, main object of revenge is the Duchess, and the avengers are her brothers, Duke Ferdinand and Cardinal. A tool villain is appointed by the avengers. His name is Bosola, who accomplishes the task of avenging the violation of degree by the Duchess. She has married her steward against the prohibitions imposed on her by her brothers. She is a young, proper teed widow, and although rich widows could marry during that time, she becomes an unwitting victim of honor killing. Once the revenge is accomplished by her brother, Duke Ferdinand, with the help of Bosola, Duke Ferdinand asks Bosola, Hey, why, what, what didst thou execute this bloody? Sentence. Bosola reminds him, by yours. Ferdinand rebukes him, mine? Was I her judge? J.W. Lever has pointed out that Webster based the action on a vendetta resulting from an unconventional match, leading to the death both of the revenger and the victim. But the revengers, as we know, are not motivated solely by their resentment at the innocent marriage of the pair, as Lever has argued, the marriage may be wanton and irreligious, but their difference of rank, a shocking violation of degree, it may be accepted, but the victim is more sinned against than sinning, and therefore we cannot just justify why the Duchess was killed, why she became the object of revenge. Such confusions prevail in the period, and we find the Jacobian tragedies mired with chaos, confusion, decadence. In the plays of other Jacobian dramatists, the same is seen. Now I shall be discussing on Jacobian tragicomedy. Tragicomedy developed through genric hybridity of tragedy and comedy, either by providing a happy ending to a tragic story or by blending of serious and light moods. The term may be applied to plays of mixed means combining the conventions of tragedy and comedy. Italian playwright Battista Guarini, 1537 to 1612, mixed high and low characters in El Pastor Fidor in 1583. Beaumont and Fletcher followed his example by their Philaster or Love Lies a Bleeding in 1609. And George Chapman in 1560, George Chapman, 1560 to 1564, wrote The Widow's Tears in 1612. Problem plays of Shakespeare like Troilus and Cressida. 1602, All's Well That Ends Well, 1604, and Measure for Measure in 1604, mixed serious and comic scenes. Therefore, between 1608 and 1612, we find that Shakespeare writing more tragic comedies and dramatic romances such as Cymbeline, The Tempest, and The Winter's Tale, as well as the historical plays like Pericles, written in collaboration with George Wilkins and Henry the 
eight with John Fletcher. These plays blur the distinction between tragedy and comedy. Beaumonton Fletcher's Philaster or Love Lies Are Bleeding, 1609, was perhaps the most popular tragic comedies of the Jacobian period. The play deals with the dethronement of Philaster by King of Calabria. Philaster is in love with the usurper's daughter, Arthusa, who is engaged to the Spanish prince, Prince Faramond, whose amorous affair with Megra is exposed by Arthusa. She becomes object of Faramond's revenge and accused of an affair with Bellario. Philaster believes in the story and plans to kill the pair and commit suicide. He is arrested and kept in the custody of Arthusa, who promptly marries him. It is revealed that Bellario is a girl who is infatuated with Philaster and has disguised as a boy. Thus, all is well at the end. The usurper is overthrown and Philaster is restored to the throne. Shakespeare's The Tempest has been classified as a pastoral tragic comedy, dealing with a similar theme of usurpation, revenge, matrimonial alliance, and restoration of the throne. Prospero, the erstwhile and exiled Duke of Milan, has taken up a 12 year residence with his daughter Miranda in an island after usurping Sikorax, the mother of Caliban. With his magical power, he uses Ariel to bring up all the offenders to the island. Ferdinand, the son of King Alfonso of Naples, falls in love with Miranda. Antonio restores the dukedom of Milan that he has usurped. He gives it back to Prospero. Ariel at the end is freed and the island is returned to Caliban, the rightful owner of the land. The Italians at the end prepare to sail back with the help of Ariel back to their home. Serious issues of usurpation, colonization, revenge and liberty are interwoven with romance, comedy and farce in The Tempest that is set in a pastoral world of perpetual romance. In Jacobian comedies, we have a similar tendency towards the gloomy side of life. Ben Jonson, 1570-1637, among the Jacobian playwrights was the most prolific and successful. He experimented with various theatrical styles and genres and was immensely influenced by the works of Roman playwrights such as Plotus and Terence. His earlier Elizabethan comedy of humors was appropriated with the Jacobian moral ethos. Most of the characters are obsessed with love, marriage or money using the dramaturgy of Plotus. He allows a farcical built up towards a climactic exposure of human deceit and cunning. Ben Jonson's reputation rests mainly on comedies written between 1605 and 1614. Walpone in 1605 assails crosswise. Epicoene or the silent woman written in 1609 ridicules various sorts of absurd persons. The alchemist 1610 castigates quackery and his foolish encouragers. And the Bartholomew fear 1614 is a coarse but overwhelming broadside at Puritan hypocrisy. Volpony of the Fox, according to Andrew Sanders, is Johnson's most savage comedy. I quote Johnson's most savage comedy. Johnson uses Italianate menagery of characters like Fox, Flash, Fly, Vulture, Crow, Raven, etc. in the play. The Alchemist is much closer to the Roman comedies of Plotus. In the play, Lovewit leaves London at the time of plague, leaving the care of his house to his servant, Face. With the help of his henchman, Subtle, Face uses his master's house as a center of fraud. Subtle poses as an alchemist with possession of the philosopher's stone and dupes the gullible. Characters from different walks of life are thus looted by them. Sir Epicure Mammon is the main target of the tricksters. Finally, the master returns and discovers the fraud and keeps the booty. Face cleverly plants Dame Pliant as a suitable bride and Lovewit marries her. The servant is reconciled with the master at the end of the play. Therefore, all is well at the end. The light-hearted romantic comedies of the Elizabethan period, however, go missing from the Jacobian stage and Jacobian city comedies are tinged with unhappy marriages, deaths, adultery, corruption and deceit. Comedy became more and more critical and exposed human shortcomings. 
Thomas Dekker's The Shoemaker's Holiday, 1599, of the Elizabethan period, is one of the earliest of the city comedies, remarkable for the gallery of characters it presents. Thomas Middleton, 1580 to 1627, wrote city comedies for boy actors from 1602 to 1607, such as A Mad World, My Master, 1604, A Trick to Cast the Old One, 1605, and Michael Mass Term, 1606. His comic masterpiece is, however, A Chaste Made in Cheapside, written in 1611, was produced for the adult audience and performed by the adult companies. The play parodies mercantile double dealing, exposing obsession with sex, money, procreation and inheritance. So Andrew Sanders points out that for Middleton, the social anomalies, new mercantile value system and the equation of money and sex suggest the corruption of urban society in each, in each of his plays, foxes have to be outfoxed and the old ones who lack both spiritly wit and integrity are successfully outfitted by the young. Francis Beaumont, the playwright who wrote The King of Barney Pestle as a burlesque, this play is a comedy that parodies the conventions of old-fashioned romantic knights errantry. In the play, a city apprentice Ralph becomes a grosser errant with a burning pestle as his device in the titular play within a play. Philip Passenger's play, A New Way to Pay Old Debts, 1622, was also one of the most popular of the social comedies of the period that presents Sir Giles Overreach, a cruel extortioner who snatches the property of his nephew, Frank Wellborn. In Masks, we have a new development during this Jacobian period. During the reign of James I, Marx emerged as an important theatrical form, especially for court entertainment, performance at the court on special occasions. The performance of Marx differed from the public theatre's performance of the Globe, the Blackfriars and the London theatres. The Marx were performed in private royal halls such as banqueting halls of in Whitefield, Whitehall. The production of Marx was expensive, with lavish costumes, elaborate stage designs, and spectacular effect. Inigo Jones, who designed the sets and introduced the proscenium arch, worked mostly in collaboration with Ben Johnson and borrowed the entire form from Italy and introduced a new architectural style to English theatre. The marks depended on the spectacular scenic effects, music, dance, and a celebratory atmosphere. Ben Johnson's The Mask of Beauty was intended I quote, to glorify the court and give the courtiers an opportunity to perform. According to I4 events, in 1605, Johnson prepared the mask of blackness, for which Inigo Jones did the design and in which Queen and her ladies appeared. This is perhaps the first record of female performers on the Jacobian theater. In Shakespeare's The Tempest, an insert betrothal mask is performed to entertain and bless Miranda and Ferdinand. This mask also requires female roles, elaborate costume, music and dance. Later in the 17th century, Jacobian open third stage was replaced during the restoration by the new theatre architect and during that period, the proscenium theatre became more popular and the Baroque theatre drawn from France and Italy became more popular in England. For this discussion, I have consulted a few books on history. You can consult these books like Albert's History of English Literature, Chambers' is The Elizabethan Stage, Cardin's Penguin Dictionary of Literary Terms and Literary Theory is a reference book that is very helpful. David Deitch's A Critical History of English Literature, you can consult. W. H. Hudson's An Outline History of English Literature, Ausby's Cambridge Guide to Literature in English, and Andrew Sanders as the short Oxford History of English Literature. These books are good for historiography of the Jacobian drama. G. L. Stein's Drama Stage and Audience and later on the English Stage, both the books are very helpful for the introduction to Jacobian age. With this I conclude. The areas that you need to discuss in this 